Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you today back to our time together at Bethel Baptist Church in Vilas, North Carolina. What a beautiful morning we have outside today. And for those of you who are tuning in, I want to tell you I've been praying for you this week. And for those special needs, I thank you for texting and uh, calling and notifying the church office or me personally. Uh, I want to be in prayer with you and according to your needs, and so keep me posted. Uh, today we're going to start right in. I want you to take your Bibles and look with me in the book of Romans chapter 1. And today we're going to be talking about take. can you take the truth when God gives it to you. And I want to read some of this out of the New Living, and uh, then I'll switch back over to my regular Bible, but I want to share something with you out of Romans 1, 18. And so uh, it talks about truth in this text right here. And, and the day that we're living in right now, my goodness, I, I am uh, amazed at how today the truth is attacked day after day after day. And we're going to talk about some of the lies uh, that have been exchanged for truth. And we know that we get truth out of the Word of God. Romans 1, 18. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they would not worship him as God or even give God thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. Now you stop and think today about the foolish ideas that we have in this world about what God is like. And as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping, worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people and birds and animals and reptiles. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. I, I love the way this is worded here in verse 25. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the things God created instead of the Creator who himself is worthy of eternal praise. And I, I believe that is no more relevant than today as we see people worshiping the earth. We, we've, got, we've got people driving around with bumper stickers talking about Mother God and, uh, and, and uh, the earth and all. So that is why, verse 26, God abandoned them. He abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women have turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulge in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking. Now guys, we're sitting around today having conversations. I hear it every day. I even hear news commentators talking about where is this craziness coming? Well, God's telling us right here in the first chapter of the book of Romans. He tells us where all this, this craziness comes from. When people abandon him, they reject his truth. Look, uh, verse 28, since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Now, I want to tell you, you don't have to go any further than the streets of America, ladies and gentlemen, much less the rest of the world, to say, where did all of this go? What, what is it? Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, gossip. 
They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. <laughs> We're seeing that today. And they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand. They break their promises. They are heartless, and they have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do, do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Now, I've been telling folks about uh, all the stuff that we see. You know, today when people do wrong, it, it's not just like they just do wrong, but they want you to do wrong. They want me to do wrong. They're doing wrong, so they want everybody to do wrong. And uh, and so I believe, how do things change? I remember back when President Obama first became president, he was running and all like that, and he was running on how he believed in one man and one woman uh, in marriage, that marriage was between a man and a woman and all like that. Well, he had no more become president until he totally changed. And by the time he got through with eight years, <clears throat> not only did he and his wife profess this and, and push it and promote it, but they wanted me to accept it. They want you to accept it. That, that what God condemns as wrong in the Bible, they want uh, us to accept. And it's not just him. I mean, it's m many and people in leadership, people in the public eye. And so... Uh, I want to ask you today, uh, we're going to talk about truth, and I believe that truth is in the Word of God, and that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I tell people, I don't believe Jesus is the best way to heaven. I believe he's the only way to heaven. And Jesus said, I am the way, I'm the truth, and I am the light. The, the Bible says in John chapter 17 and verse 17, it says, Thy word is truth. And in John 14, 6, that's where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. The scripture says in Hebrews 6, 18, it is impossible for God to lie. So today we're going to talk about, um, you know, uh, where uh, the truths of God and how have they been changed into lies. When we read in that text there in Romans 1 down in verse 22, I'm going to go back to my regular Bible now, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God uh, un uh, into made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. And verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie. Some of those things I think about, seven different things I just jotted down here. Uh, today you can pick and choose for yourself or your children your own gender. And they have denied what the Bible says in Genesis uh, chapter 5 and down in verse 1 and 2. Male and female created he them. But, but now people are saying, well, science tells us this and science tells us that. And people are always uh, talking about science. But uh, can I just tell you, the Bible says when God creates us, he makes you a male or he makes you a female. Uh, the, even in the new math, I've been watching it on the news as I'm sure you have this week that they're teaching in some places here in our schools in America. Uh, they're teaching that two plus two now equals five. It's a new math. They said this is the new math because we don't want to make anybody feel bad. And oh, uh, oh number three, they're say, talking about men can have a baby. What that and and you know how on earth that you we know that's impossible and yet you you and I are being asked to accept something that is an impossibility because of the uh, wokeness of of now that is taking place in America. Uh, I was hurt. I heard on the news this last week how that one very prominent. Uh, politician and another very famous, very wealthy man said that in nine years, 
uh, the world is going to burn up because of climate change and global warming. And, uh, you know, the Bible says over in Genesis chapter 8 and down in verse 22, and I want to read this to you because, guys, I want you to know, you know, God gave us a promise in Genesis chapter 9. God gave us a promise, and he put a bow in the clouds, a bow in the heaven, that he was never again going to destroy the earth with a flood. Over in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 11, God says, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. He's not going to do uh, Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God says, this is a token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Now God says, I, I, I'm making a promise to you. I'm not going to destroy the world by flood. I said, don't worry about it. And, and a reminder, every time we see a rainbow, God says, that's my covenant. I'm keeping my promise. I'm not going to destroy the world with a flood. Well, what about burning up, Pastor? I, I, <clears throat> I, don't you believe in climate change and global warming? And I believe that the earth changes in temperature. And I tell you what, I, I don't want anybody to think, I don't believe that we should be good stewards of the earth we live in. We need to take care of where we, God's given us a beautiful world to live in, and we all take care of it. But I don't want anybody I know and love worried that the earth's going to burn up in <laughs> In any few years until after you and I are gone, the Bible says God's going to, one day the earth is going to be purified by fire, but it's not while mankind is here. Look in Genesis 8, 22, and here's what it says. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Guys, you can't get any plainer than that. And the reason I mention this is because people used to say that the earth was flat. And over in the book of Isaiah, you know, if people, that, you know, there were a lot of people who didn't believe it, but the science of the day declared that, uh, that the world was flat. And they thought they were just going to be out walking or out on a sea and all of a sudden they were going to go over the edge of the earth. That was the science of the day. But in Isaiah chapter 40 and down in verse uh, uh, 21 and 22, it says this, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he, listen to this now, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Guys, God put it right there in the Bible that the work, he sits on the circle of the earth. The earth was never flat, and it's, it's, it's always going to be round because that's the way God made it. And... Uh, uh, so I think about that, and then I think about one of the biggest lies that men have changed the truth of God into a lie. And we're told by, by uh, politicians, by leaders in our country, by, by scientists, so, so to be called, that uh, life does not begin until a person is outside the womb. But I want to tell you that in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, and back in Jeremiah chapter 1 and uh, down in verses 4 and 5, look at it. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. 
Now, guys, he's not just talking to Jeremiah, but God is saying human life begins at conception. And God even knows us before that, guys. That's the truth from the Word of God. Now, listen, what we read in Romans 8, uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 through 32 today was the Bible said, how did truth become shaped into a lie? Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you five things today I want you to hear, and I want to make sure I get all of this in today because I believe it's so very important. Number one, God loves you so much that he has given to us the whole truth. Okay? God loves you so much that he has given to us the whole truth. Now, is there more to be known? Oh, yeah. But God's not going to tell you and me and our little pe peanut brains things that we're not going to conceive. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts than our thoughts, saith the Lord. There's something God's not going to tell you and me about. Cause we, but I will tell you, are we ever learning? Oh, yeah. The Bible says we are ever learning, yet never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Okay. God loves you so much that he has given us the whole truth. Secondly, God loves you so much that he has given to us his holy word, the Bible. Uh, number three, God loves us so much that he gave us his own son to come into a sin-soaked world to die for our sins and to offer for to you and me, to us, the free gift of salvation with him in heaven forever. Number four, God in his kindness loves you and me so much that he absolutely does not force us to love him or believe in him or even receive him. God allows us the freedom to choose to love him or obey him or if, if that's what you want to do, to despise him, hate him, reject him. God is so good. He has given to you and me. He said, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. Do you realize how important it is that we, you and I have got freedom of choice, even with our maker, with God? God says, I love you and I've got a plan for you and I want the best for you and I want to save you and I want to bring you to heaven to spend eternity. But if you don't want that, you can choose not to accept it. You can choose hell over heaven. You can choose rejection over acceptance. God made you and me and he says, here's truth. But some of you can't take truth. And that's what he's saying. Number five. God loves you and me so much that he has kept you and me alive until today. <laughs> Everybody listening today, all of you who are listening today, God loves you so much that he has kept some of you alive until today so that you have one more choice, one more opportunity for the biggest and most important decision of your life. Today you can ask him to forgive you of your sins. You can Tell the Lord you want to accept and believe in his son, Jesus Christ, who came at God's, at God's gift. He came as God's gift to come into an old sinful world, live a perfect life, and die a sinless death so that he could purchase you and pay for your sins and to present you as part of the family of God. Now let's go back to number one. God loves you so much that he's given us the whole truth. Creation, the truth about creation of the world, the truth about life, the truth about sin and salvation, heaven and hell. Uh, somebody t asked me the other day, said, Brother Charlie, did Jesus ever talk about hell? He said, I was talking to somebody today that said Jesus didn't believe in hell. I said, absolutely not. I said, matter of fact, Jesus taught more about hell than he did about heaven. And, uh, and, and so, you know, people try to take the truth of God and turn it into a lie. I want to tell you, the truth is there is a heaven. And God wants everybody to be there. The Bible says he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. John three sixteen. 
He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have eternal life. And, and so, uh, uh, so God gives us the truth about his plans. In Jeremiah 18, God says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. God's got a plan for your life, but you can turn the truth of God into a life just because you had never looked for God. And, uh, and he, he tells the truth about time and eternity. He tells the truth about decisions and judgment. He tells the truth about the end of the earth and eternity and love and forgiveness and grace and all of these things. But uh, I'm so glad God has given us the truth. I wanted to uh, read something from me. A friend of mine who was a physicist by the name of Jay Seegert. Jay, Jay goes around to churches now, and I had him at my church in Florida several times. I've had him up here several times at Bethel. And uh, I love it when I, when Jay gets up to speak and he, and he uses the greatest, uh, 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 you know, techniques of presenting his uh, story as a physicist and as a scientific mind and all and talking about the Bible and the Word of God and science. But uh, he, he writes in one of his little books, scientists are, are unbiased, dash, really? We generally assume that scientists are completely unbiased, simply following the evidence wherever it leads. This, however, is often not the case, as attested by science historian Professor Eveline Richards. She writes this, Science is not so much concerned with truth as it is with consensus. What counts as truth is what scientists can agree to count as truth at any particular moment in time. Scientists, scientists are not really receptive or, or not really open-minded to any sorts of criticisms or any sorts of claims that actually are attacking some of the established parts of the research, a traditional paradigm, in this case, neo-Darwinism. So it is very difficult for people who are pushing claims that contradict the paradigm to even get a hearing. They'll find it difficult to get research grants. They'll find it hard to get their researches published. They'll, in fact, find it very hard, uh, find it very hard for a Christian, his or her bias or presuppositions is rooted in the belief that God is the creator and the Bible is his inspired and inerrant word. For most scientists, their bias and presuppositions are rooted in the belief that God is not the creator and that the Bible is not his inspired and inerrant word. These two diametrically opposed worldviews have a significant impact on how facts are interpreted. I copied this out of the American uh, family. To me, it's obvious that for our nation to succeed, its people must be restrained by personal morality. But for our morality to, base, to be based on eternal truth and thus be honoring to God, it must be informed by the Word of God. And that's why they say they promote, as we do, they promote the Bible as the Word of God, for it alone is the standard of faith and practice for the church. Secondly, it, we defend a Christian worldview. The way that we look at the world is totally different from the way that people who God has turned over to a reprobate mind, what, what do they think about the world? It's totally different than what I believe. To defend a Christian worldview because the Bible teaches all men everywhere and at all times uh, to how they should live their lives. And then thirdly, we are here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it alone is the power of God to save and to sanctify all who believe. You know, uh, the Bible is so important. If God loves you so much that he has given to us the whole truth. And this, this Bible represents, I tell people when I'm teaching from God's Word so many times, because I want everybody to never forget this. This is God's love letter to you and me. But it's also God's instruction manual for how to live life 
how to live, how to die, how to prepare for the seasons of life. It's God. So God loves you so much that he has given to us his holy word, the Bible. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism, and uh, I wanted to read something uh, to you about that today because it is, it is so great. Uh, this first on the Word of God, the authority of God's Word. John Leland, a Baptist pastor who heavily influenced the writing of religious freedom into the Constitution, advised that the minute we develop a creed, we will have developed a cult that will stand between us and God. Therefore, he said, there should be only one creed, and that's the word of God and no other. That advice was wise in those days and is wise today. They believe that every believer is competent to read and to interpret scripture under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Some of them gave their lives to defend the concept that every person has the right to go to the Word of God for himself or herself. They insisted that people need no other mediator, whether a priest or someone else, to teach them the Word of God, because the Bible says there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit makes the Word come alive. John Wesley, and that's what I wanted to get to, the, the founder of Methodism. And uh, I want to tell you what a, what a dynamic, godly guy John Wesley was, the great evangelist and theologian of Christian history who was the father of Methodism, wrote, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way for this very end he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Give me the book of God. And here's what it said at the end of that. The Bible is like no other book. This is because the Bible is God's book. It is, defi it is divine authoritative, infallible, inerrant, God-breathed, and truth without any mixture of error. So God loves us so much that he's given to us his holy word, the Bible. God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus Christ came into the world as God's greatest gift. The Bible tells us that salvation is not earned by being a Baptist or a Catholic, a Methodist or a Presbyterian. You don't you you can't be good enough, you can't get baptized enough different ways to get to heaven. You can't join enough churches to get to heaven. You can't give enough money in the offering plate to get to heaven. I won't tell you what. God uh, loves us and he gave to us the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. God in his kindness loves you and me so much that he absolutely does not force us to believe in him or receive him. He allows us the freedom of choice to love and obey him or to despise and reject him. And last of all, God loves you so much that he has kept you alive until today so that you have one more choice. Can I tell you that your decision is a one-time decision there's no turning back. We used to sing that song in our youth group. Uh, I had decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Guys, I want to tell you, when you accept Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Savior, He comes when you ask Him to. When you are willing to say, Lord, I want to turn over the leadership of my life to you. You, I just word it this way sometimes when I'm talking to people. I said, you're driving down the road of life. You need to stop your car. You slide over into the passenger seat and turn the steering wheel from now and forever over to God. That's what you're doing when you trust him to become Lord and Savior. You need to ask him in simple prayer. Dear God, the best way I know how right now I want to make a right decision, a godly decision, a biblical decision. I want to ask you to forgive me of my sins. 
come into my life and be my Savior and my Lord. Your decision is a one-time decision. It also is an eternal decision because the decision you make now determines where you're going to spend eternity. You will live and you will die and you will spend forever with this decision. I hope that today, those of you who have joined us in, I, I hope today that you can, can take the truth. Because all I have done today is simply shared with you from the Word of God. And I want to tell you, His Word is truth. Man has changed the truth of God into a lie. Never has this been more obvious in all the world than it is today. Because some of you are wondering, why can't I get out of the mess I'm in? So, uh, uh, they, I saw a sign one time It said, they say there's a reason for everything. But the reason you may be where you are is because you still keep making stupid choices. Are you making stupid choices? Have you thought this thing really through? Have you really understood that you're not going to be here for forever, but you're going to be somewhere for forever? You need to pre prepare today for tomorrow and for eternity. I challenge you today, don't let the lies of this world take the place of God's truth and his word to you and me. Let me close in prayer. Lord, thank you for this time together today. I pray, God, not for my words, but I pray, O oh God, for your words to be heard and accepted today. I pray for each person, Lord, who needs to make that decision right now before they even move from where they're sitting. Make that decision right now to ask for your forgiveness of their sins as they commit their life to you. God bless your word today. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you for being with us today.